The title of this message is, I was going to title it, God is Too Kind, but the real title is, Hell Sends a Distorted View of God. Hell Sends a Distorted View of God. On Moses' second visit to Mount Sinai, you know, he went up the first time and the Israelites went to idolatry, so he broke the tablets. God had him go back up for another 40 days. He warned his brother Aaron to keep things under control. And before he went up, and you can see it in Exodus 33, 18, he asked God, God, I want to see your glory. I want to see what you really look like. God talked to him, but always in a cloudy mist, like a glow, but the cloud protected Moses from God's power and from actually seeing it. I mean, I assume it was by the way God describes it face to face, but with a barrier to protect Moses. And Moses said, I want to see what you really look like. And there's something interesting in there that I, you know, actually some of this I got from listening to another minister, but, you know, I, we take material where we can get it. Uh, not the part about the glory part, but this particular verse, Exodus 34, 6. This is right after it. And he emphasized certain words. And I want to see if I can emphasize it the way he did it. 34, 6. Exodus 34, verse 6. Um, so before God let Moses see his glory, he showed him or told him his greatest glory. God's greatest glory is not his awesome power, but his character, his love, his kindness. And we probably never think of it that way. But before, he showed him his power, you know, the bright, you know, uh, the, un the, the light that's unthinkably bright, you know, the unapproachable light and power that's God. Before he did that, here's what he said, verse 6. Um, <clears throat> the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, or we probably say Jehovah or Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And the NIV puts it this way. Here's the words it emphasized. Compassion, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and goodness and truth, faithfulness, in the first part of verse 7, forgiving wickedness. That's how God's things is described. Would you all repeat these words with me? I just want to re repeat them again so we kind of get them in our mind. God is first. Let's all say compassionate. Compassionate. God is gracious. Let's say gracious. God is abounding in love. Abounding in love. God is faithfulness. Faithfulness. God is forgiving. Forgiving. And I just think sometimes you have to almost remember that because that's the first thing God showed him, that he is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger. Let me make a point that uh, we didn't think about until I was talking with my wife about this. And I said, the year that uh, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, some will say 1491 or at the latest 1450, if you take those 70 years that they were in Babylon as God saying, you're bad, go sit in the corner and I'll bring you back after the 70 years captivity. If you put that as sort of, because they became more godly when they actually went into exile in Babylon, as 70 years of sitting in the corner, God stayed with at least the southern house of Israel, Judah, which is three tribes, for fifth, over 15 centuries over 15 centuries and about seven centuries with both houses. Now think about that. And, and it's not 15 centuries of them being little angels. 15 centuries of all kinds of rebellion, challenges to God, idolatry, we could add up. Uh, with, the, with the northern 10 tribes, because they changed the religion, we believe they changed the feast dates the Sabbaths, and they put in priests who did not know the Bible, who were not Levites, not trained, so the king could control the religion. Because they lost the structure and discipline of the religion, they never, never actually repented. 
You know, Judah went into some repentance cycles where they would repent, come back, repent, come back. The northern ten tribes, it was bad, worse, bad, even worse than ever, and the worst, worst, worst. All the way to God said, that's it. And even after God, <clears throat> after 70 AD, when the last of the tribes of Israel were kicked out of the Middle East, God was still compassionate to them. I would contend, if you look at the period, the last 2,000 years, most of the time, I know it's there are ups and downs, but most of the time, I would say the kingdom of Judah has been blessed more than the average person on earth. They've been more prosperous. And the northern ten tribes, if they are where we think they are, northwestern Europe, Scandinavia, and the British Isles, have been blessed more than most other nations. And we're enjoying some of those blessings today. I mean, all you got to do is just go south of the border of Mexico, and you will see what I mean. So even after God divorces Israel, he still blesses them and takes care of them in ways that aren't always so obvious. And I just, because when it says he's slow to anger, most people have this idea of the God of the Old Testament is, is, has a hair trigger temper and is throwing lightning bolts around. And I understand that's a misunderstanding of the Bible. The Bible is easy to misunderstand. Most people don't know from John 1 that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. There's no conflict. They're one and the same person. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, after that, then Moses saw his, his great power. Um, you can read about that later in the same chapter, where he's unapproachable light, a pure source of energy. Let's go to Jonah 4.2. I know we've talked about these scriptures before, but... You know, they say repetition's a good thing. <laughs> you got to hear it many times to try to keep our carnal nature on track. Now, let me give you a little background of Jonah. Jonah, uh, there is a little story in, the old, in, in Kings which implies that Jonah had some success in the northern ten tribes of Israel. So he was a prophet, probably had been working for God for a number of years, so he knew God. You know, he knew Jehovah or Yahweh or Jehovah. He knew the God of Israel. He knew what he was like. Um, and when God asked him to go to warn Nineveh, he didn't want to go because he wanted Nineveh destroyed. They were a rival and a threat to Israel. And eventually they did take um, Israel captive a century later. So he was right in his own, you know, it's like, sort of like France and prior to World War I being afraid of Germany. It made sense, you know, like, that we think the Ninevites are the Germans, uh, historically. But he had his reason. They're very violent people. He said, God, destroy them. And he did not want to take a chance that they might repent. Let's look at Jonah 4.2. This is after they repented. Jonah is mad. He's sitting up on a mountain hoping God will blast them anyway. And this is what Jonah says, verse 2. And he prayed unto of the eternal God it said, I pray to you, O Jehovah, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country, when it was in Israel? Therefore I fled before you unto Tarshish, for I knew that you are, now here's what Jonah knew about God, that you are gracious. That's what he was afraid of. You're going to give these bad, violent Ninevites a chance, and I don't want you to give them a chance. I'm willing to risk my life to because I don't want him to repent. As he says, <clears throat> for you are merciful, slow to anger. Remember, that's one of the things we saw at Exodus, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentance you of evil. When it says repentance you of evil, repent means to change your mind about something. In other words, he knew that there was a chance that he might change his mind about striking down the Ninevites, about paying them for their evil. And he realized that God is likely to do that because he's been very merciful to the northern ten tribes. He put up with them for centuries. You know, they had all kinds of bad kings and Jezebel. And uh, you get the general idea. Um, and they hadn't yet been kicked out. And we look at that and we think, what's wrong with Jonah? 
but I think I do understand. Jonah knew how gracious and kind and forgiving God was. He says, there's a chance, as bad as these Ninevites are, if they show even some reasonable repentance, God might let them off the hook. And that's what happened. And uh, historically, it turned out to be bad for Israel. But I understand. And when you read that, sometimes we forget that that's how God is, uh, that he's very gracious, he's merciful. He would prefer to give people a break. And sometimes when we messed up, remember, God wants to give you a break. God is gracious. He's kind. He wants to be helpful. He's slow to anger, of great kindness. And, you know, he's ready to repent. You know, it didn't take Moses a lot to talk God out of not doing in the Israelites. I'm not taking anything away from Moses, but that's how God tends to be. Um, I've got some scriptures here. These are a printout, and I'm just going to read a few of them, but you could get on the computer and put in things like kindness, graciousness, and God, and you'll come up with a long list. We came up with three pages. I'm just going to read a few just to make a point. Um, Psalms 86.5, For you, Lord, are good, ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy. Psalms 23.6, Surely goodness and mercies shall follow me all the days of my life. L Lamentations 3, um, 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. There's actually a Christian song about his mercy lasts forever, and it goes on. They repeat that. It's a great song. His mercy lasts forever and ever. And they took it from that verse. Second uh, Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and a God of all comfort. Psalms 103, 4. Who redeemeth your life from destruction of loving kindness and tender mercies. Uh, Psalms 103.8, the Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. Psalms 107.1, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And that, there's another song about that one, oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Anyway, you all know that it's in the song book, but it's taken from that book. And as I said, there are three more pages, and I didn't even quote all of them. I'm just making a point that the verses I'm choosing, they're not the only ones. It's not like you pick one little verse and everything else is the opposite. No, the, it's in the Bible. People just haven't noticed it. Let's go to Matthew 5, because I want to make the point that God is gracious. People who really know him, like Moses and Jonah, know that he's gracious and forgiving. And in Matthew 5, 44, uh, Christ is expanding the law so people can see the spiritual intent of it. And he says, 5, 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You know, if, if everybody in the world were taught that, think of how kind the world would be. You're not just nice to the people you like. You're nice to the people you don't like. Instead, you know what the world is like. There was some guy was killed a week ago over loud music. Whatever the details were, it don't really matter, but you get the general idea. <clears throat> now, why did God tell him that? Why, why is God telling us to love our enemies? Verse 45, that you may be the children of your father. Think about that. God wants you to have that kind of love so you can be like him because you want your children to grow up to be like your best traits so we can be like the Father because the Father um, loves everybody. Even Satan the devil, I believe he's locked away because he'll just cause troubles. That's the only thing you can do with him. Um, <clears throat> so they may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Um, 
I'm not going to read this verse, but in Leviticus 19, 17, 18, in the law, it tells people that they should take care of their neighbor's property and stuff and be kind to the neighbors, even the neighbors that they don't particularly like. That's in the law, Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. It's been there, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And most people don't know it. Now, what's the problem with hell? Hell, as it's come down to us, as it's perceived by most people in the world, puts God in a position of being a cruel sadist. Because it's sadistic to torture people forever and ever and ever. In other words, as Dante described in his writings, uh, <clears throat> or he elaborated, and you can see many of those drawings, you can get old books and see them that come from the Dark Ages, and people are hung upside down and being tortured. And, um, you're burned, and then you hurt from the burning, and then you're healed, and then you're burned, and then you're hurt again, and then you're healed, then you're burned, hurt, healed. And that goes on not for 10,000 years, not for 20,000 years, not for 50,000 years, but forever. Now, think about the level of cruelty. That premise puts God in a really bad situation. And I would argue, whichever standards you use for who's in hell and who's not in hell, uh, the vast majority of the world is in hell because you realize Christianity is a minority religion even today. Maybe one in, even if by the broadest definition, maybe one in six or seven. Islam is bigger and, uh, anyway, and if you go back historically in all the pagan years when there was no Christianity and the few pagans knew God, that is maybe 80 or 90 percent of the world would be in hell. So with any way you slice it, the vast majority would be down there being tortured forever and ever. And it's, uh, and this doctrine came from ancient Egypt. And I believe, at least in part, it was used by the priests to gain power. You know, I can scare you. If you don't do what we want, we'll assign you to hell. And you know some of the abuses that happened during the Dark Ages regarding that sort of thing. That's one of the reasons Martin Luther's indulgences did some of the things he did. But um, the early um, church fathers, beginning with Tertullian, 165 to 225 AD, brought that pagan idea into Christianity. Further elucidated by Dante Alighieri and his work, The Divine Comedy. Isn't that a great name? The Divine Comedy, 1308. And there are all kinds of weird drawings of people being suffering. And they say he also did it because he had some friends that bullied him as a kid, and he loved the idea of, of scaring them and seeing them being tortured in hell. That's what I read. So um, there's another flaw to that belief, too. It rewards Satan, at least the way it's described by Dante and others. In other words, what Satan does is he deceives people here in this life because sin is deceptive, like, like the kid who gets hooked on horrible drugs. Well, it's a great fun, it's a great high, great party thing, and then it takes over his life, and someday he overdoses on drugs, and the next thing he wakes up, he's in hell. And the devil said, I tricked you to get you down here, and now I get to have the fun, I mean, from the devil's perspective, it's fun, of torturing you forever and ever, because the devil is sadistic. We may get to, to that demon-possessed guy in the Bible study today, and you'll see what I mean when I say demons are sadistic. They would actually enjoy that. It'd be rewarding the devil. The more people I can deceive, the more that I can torture down in hell forever and ever. Why would God reward Satan? The truth is, I believe that's Satan's fate. Satan will be put in a bottomless pit, Revelation 20 three, and verse 3, forever and ever. He's let go a few years to test some people, and then he's put back in. But basically, he knows that that's his fate. Not that Satan could be harmed by fire or, or because he's a spirit being and he can't die. But being locked up is going to be mental torment for those demons and Satan. Right now, they're running around causing trouble, and they're enjoying it, I mean, in a sadistic way. So they're enjoying causing trouble and panic and getting people to blow each other up and kill each other and all the bad things going on. But when they're locked up, it's going to be terrible forever and ever. That's not mankind's fate. Man is quite, um, our spirit can be erased by God. 
In other words, eternal life is a gift. You don't have it until God gives it to you, which means the lake of fire will burn you to ashes and you'll be gone. And, and we've talked about Malachi. The end of Malachi says the, the wicked will be ashes. That means they're gone. They're not there. Um, but remember, sin is deceitful. The devil is smooth and clever. There's no way God is going to reward him for all the things he's doing. Speaking of the devil, this is a short, corny story. I'm going to tell you the shorter stories, the longer ones. This bartender um, has a big sign over the bar that says, $1,000 for anybody that can get a drop more out of a lemon than I can. And this guy has exercised his hands. It's a real gripping muscle. And he's a big, strong guy. He cuts the lemon and he squeezes it. And he gets every drop out. And then he gives it to somebody. You get $1,000, you can get one more drop. And people grab it and they, they can't get another drop out. One day, this skinny little old guy comes in there. He says, I'll take up your bet. I want a thousand bucks. The bartender laughed. There's no chance you can do it. He cuts the lemon. He squeezes it. Every drop is out. He hands it to the little old man. The little old man grabs it. Not only did he get one drop, he gets seven drops out of it. The guy is shocked. He says, I can't believe it. How did you do that? Eh, it's not that big a deal. But, well, what, what do you do? He says, I'm retired. From what work? I used to, to be an auditor for the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> Having been audited, I understand that. <laughs> they demand you give a little something before they end that audit. But, um, but another point is that the devil is good at squeezing all the evil out of the society he can. Can you kind of sense it? He get this one to fight that one, or um, they're going to legalize or decriminalize more drugs. You all know that's going to lead to more decadence and problems, don't you? You can almost sense it, can't you? We see it coming down the pike. And God is not going to reward the devil by letting him pull more people into this torture fantasy. Let's go to Ephesians 2. Uh, Ephesians, we're going to read verse 4. Remember, there are all kinds of verses. I'm just picking just a few because I just want to make a basic point today. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God is rich in mercy. Would you like that terminology? Rich, rich, rich in mercy. You know, there's some people who won't give you a break. You cross them once and... There's one show I'm watching on TV, and the, the theme, at least one of the themes of the show, is this semi-villain is anybody that crosses him, boy, that's it. He really follows through with his, well, anyway. But God is rich in mercy for his great love, great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. In other words, God loved us when we were the worst sinners, when we were dead dead and wrapped up in sins, he loved us and quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. God gave his son to save us. Now we say that, it's a common expression, God gave his son to save us. But when you go back to the story of Abraham, you realize it's, more, it's greater than it sounds. I want to put yourself in God the Father's shoes for a minute. And he knew what he wanted uh, Christ to do. He wanted Christ to die in a very, uh, as Christ said, the Mount of Olives, can we find an easier way to do this? But they agreed to do it the hard way, to show their love for mankind and to be a total sacrifice. Do you realize that was harder for God than it was for Christ? Let me give you my opinion. It'd be like if your son came to you and he had to go through something really bad like that, and the choice was you go through it or he go through it. Most people would say, I'll go through it and let my son off the hook. It was harder for God the Father to let Christ do it than for him to do it. You know, just, he watched it until the very end when he turned away, you know, because of the sins of the world put on Christ. But that was hard for God the Father. Obviously, it was hard for Christ, too. Well, the point I'm making is, that's the price Christ and God the Father paid for our grace. That's how important we are to God. And when we're feeling down, and things aren't going well, 
my human nature or other people. A lot of times it's other people. They like a Murphy's conspiracy against you. When they're giving you a hard time, remember God loves us. He paid a high price for us. And though things aren't going to go all well for us at times because God lets us be tried and, and the world isn't that good, God loves us. He's with us. He paid a great price for us. And just try to remember you're saved by grace and, and just never, ever, ever forget that. Uh, 2 Peter 3.9. This is one of those general epistles after Hebrews, 2 Peter 3, 9. <clears throat> the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but long-suffering. In other words, God is really patient, really patient, long-suffering to usward. Not willing that any, not willing that any should perish. I want to emphasize that word. Not willing that any should perish. In other words, it's not a question of God says, well, I don't mind if 80, 90 percent of mankind dies and this torture to them, hell, I'll save what I can. No, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I realize, and the Bible does agree with this, that all won't come to repentance because God is... It's a voluntary thing, uh, but I believe the vast, vast, vast majority of mankind will come to repentance. The one thing we have to worry about is we're at greater risk because we're in the middle of Satan's world, so it's a little harder for us, but we get the greater reward. But God wants all of us to make it. He's here to help us. When you need help, just pray and ask God to give you that extra help because God doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want any to perish because God is love and very patient. And most people don't really know and understand the Bible, um, and so they don't see his kindness, but it's there. Um, and it's not a temporary thing. It's a permanent part of his great character. Let's go to 1 John 4, 7, and 8. 1 John 4, 7, and 8. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So he's saying beloved means we're loved by God. That's what beloved means. We're loved by God, and God doesn't say just return love to him. He says love each other. Love each other. Love each other. Verse 8, he that loveth, that is God who loves us, uh, loveth not, knoweth not God. So if you don't do that, you don't really love God. For, here's a word I want to emphasize. For God is love. Verse 8, for God is love. And it's agape love. It's a pure love. I realize there's erotic love and there's other kinds of love, like the the Philadelphian kind of love when you get back to the original Greek, kind of a buddy-to-buddy -buddy love, or I love cheeseburgers, or I love chocolate ice cream, but that's not the same as godly love. Godly love is higher. It's pure. It's more spiritual. It's not based on, what are you going to give me back? Like, you love butter pecan ice cream because you love the taste of butter pecans. You're getting something back. Or, or saying with erotic love, this is pure and higher. God is love. And remember that. If anyone tries to scare you with hellfire, you're going to be tortured forever. A God who is love would never, never tolerate torturing people forever and ever. If they're so wicked, like Hitler or Dr. Mingala, well, they'll just be gone. And they're gone. They won't cause any more trouble to them or anybody else, but he's not going to torture them forever and ever. Um, you can even argue that in some odd way, Hitler and other bad people are victim of Satan. I mean, in one context, that's true. He deceived them. And, of course, he played on their, their own evil side and, and encouraged their evil, but they're victims too, in a, in a way. And we need to learn to love each other because 
God is love, not hate, not unbridled wrath. Some people think the God of the Old Testament is unbridled wrath. They just don't know the Bible as well as they should. No way God is going to reward the demons by putting people to torture. Um, let's look at the fate of most of mankind. Revelation 20. This is the last verse that we're going to look at. Revelation 20, verse 12. We're going to try to go through it fairly carefully. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw a dead, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. By the way, you know, it mentioned the first, re the first resurrection early in the chapter, which means there have to be a second one. Because you can't have a first one, you can't have the first world war unless there's a second. So there's a second resurrection. In, in case that isn't clear, it's called the great white throne uh, resurrection from verse 11. Um, so you know, all of a sudden they all come up from the grave. Um, the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. When you read that, you don't really get the context. But books, plural, means Bible. Because actually, uh, in the Greek, biblios means Bible. That's how we got the term Bible. In the Greek, it's biblios. It's a collection of books. And that's Bible. So when it says books, plural, it means the Bible. Because that's how we got the word Bible. It's the Greek plural of a collection of books, biblios. The Bible's going to be open. You realize the Bible is not open to people today. I mean, they, they understand some of it, depending on, you know, if they go to church. By the way, church attendance in America is dropping, I think it's like 11 or 12 percent, depends on who you talk to. So even what I call a moderate Bible knowledge is probably dropping. I hear the, like you'll see someone on TV like uh, Bill O'Reilly or um, Jay Leno, and they'll ask questions about something, and the person will say, Oh, is that the Ten Commandments or is that the, um, the Bill of Rights? They don't know. I mean, literally, a lot of people couldn't tell the Bill of Rights, the Ten Bill of Rights from the Ten Commandments. They know so little that you'd be shocked. Who's vice president? Um, I could, and they ask all those questions. So when I say the vast majority don't know the Bible, that's getting truer and truer every year. I think when I was younger, people were more Bible-oriented. Well... Whatever level of knowledge the Bible was out there wasn't as good as it should have been. It's even lower now. Well, when people are going to be resurrected into a world where there be one pure government, one pure religion, run by Jesus Christ with all those top people like Daniel and Moses and David in charge, every Sabbath they're going to be taught Bible, Bible, Bible. And it says in Isaiah, people won't go around saying, know the Lord, Everybody will know him like water on the bottom of the ocean. Everybody will know God. So the Bible will be open up to everybody. And they'll all be taught the Bible. People who were maybe on the Fiji Islands, and they died in the 1400s, and all those people from before the flood, they'll get their chance. Uh, and there's one more book will be open, verse 12. And another book was open. It was a book of life. Why would God open up the book of life? For the obvious reasons, he's going to write some names in it, right? He's going to open the book of life. And these billions of people, it's, I was just kicking that route to say 10 billion, whatever it is, 10 billion, 12 billion. And they'll have a chance to have their name written in the book of life. And I would uh, speculate that if you're in a world, you remember the old world that you grew up in. You know, most people grew up in grinding poverty, political oppression religious oppression, absolute superstition and stupidity. I mean, really, to varying degrees. And they come into a world that's paradise. And the truth, um, I'm sure the vast, vast, vast majority will, will repent of their sins and with the help of us and, and, and others, you know, and, and God's family and all the right leadership, they'll have great families. And they will... We don't think there'll be any more babies born, so the population will be locked at that point. But they will uh, grow. And we even think they may, God may resurrect the aborted babies, but that's, we'll see. But, but I think he might. But regardless of how that works, a woman who aborted her two kids and now doesn't have any, she'll say, oh, they're the kids I should have had, and now I've got them, isn't that wonderful? And anyway, however the details work out, people will be happy 
They'll see that going God's way works. They'll repent, and they'll go into God's family. And God will write their name in the book of life. Um, the book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged. Judge means they will have so many years, we think, a century, in which they're judged. At the end, they'll have to, you know, repent and, and overcome their wickedness. And, you know, so obviously some people will have harder time than others because they become so wicked in this world. Um, it doesn't mean they're going to be condemned. It just means evaluated or judged. Out of those things which are written in the books. In other words, they're going to be evaluated on the Bible and Bible laws and Bible principles, because that's what books means, according to their works. But I think most of them will straighten up and fly right, you know, and like that one uh, verse says, when they start plotting evil, pop. Some spirit being will pop up behind them and says, wait a minute, we don't do that sort of thing anymore. That's in the old world. <laughs> and they'll realize a little bit of glow from you that you're somebody they can't, take care of in the old way, you know, these the bad things they used to do, and they'll repent. God will save the vast majority because God is a God of love and kindness. And remember, his love and his kindness will win out and it will persevere.